everybody knows something's happening. Uh, good evening, everybody. A very, very warm welcome here to St. Bartholomew's on this very warm evening. Uh, my name is Catherine Hill. I'm the director of the music program here at St. Bartholomew's. And over the last several years, it has been my pleasure and privilege to work with Robert in partnership first when he was in charge of the music program at St. James Cathedral and to do all kinds of uh, singing together of all kinds of different music from the early Middle Ages to five minutes ago. Uh, Robert, as probably all of you know, is an extremely accomplished musician who has thought deeply about what does what is music, what is it all for, and we're going to hear about that in the context of music for worship this evening. Uh, but if you want someone to play a mean jazz piano at your next reception, Rob is the guy to do it. If you want a beautiful tenor voice that can sing anything, then just get Rob to do it. And if you want your choir to sound better than ever, he can come in and do that too. So um, uh, I just want to mention, we do have a free will offering box at the back there. To, uh, if you find tonight's presentation to be edifying and enjoyable and every good thing, then uh, please be welcome to contribute. Uh, and without any further ado, I present to you Robert Bushakiewicz. Thanks, Catherine. I just want to say uh, thank you again to Walter Hannum for inviting me to speak with you this evening. And I want to start by playing you one of my favorite comedy sketches from the comedy duo Mitchell and Webb. You might have heard of them, the UK comedy duo. Um, I don't have the visual, but you can imagine it. It's really, it begins with two flatmates coming home from a hard day's work. Oh, you look wiped out. You okay? Oh. Yeah, you know. Top down the wall. Yeah, yeah. Come with new admissions. Little lad with a pronounced heart murmur. Poor little kid. He's going to pull through, but Sarah is back on the ventilator, which meant I had to liaise with the consultants at King's. Mm, those guys. Exactly. Yeah, it's hitting bed crisis time. I just don't know where I can physically fit any more severely ill children on my ward. Still, this is sorry to unload on you. How was your day at the ice cream factory? <laughs> oh, you know, fine. Come on, it, it's okay, you can say. Well... I guess it was a bit of a hard day at the ice cream factory. <laughs> All right. Poor you. I mean, compared to your day, it was nothing, but... It's fine. Listen, we've been through this. Just because I'm a paediatrician dealing with severely ill children doesn't mean that you can't have a tough day tasting ice cream at the ice cream factory. But it's really trying to push the rum and raisin thing, you know? Trying to ride that whole kitsch revival, the bomb with the raspberry ripple. You remember that whole storm? But we've got a similar situation, which is I'm having to spend a lot more time than usual on the ward for children who, sadly, we, we know just aren't going to get better and, and it's hard because you know you look into their parents eyes and you really just don't know what to say yeah yeah that is quite similar isn't it <laughs> but sometimes keith I, I feel that ice cream tasting isn't somehow as important as looking after sick and dying children oh, oh of course it is Look, I work hard saving children's lives, but you work just as hard ensuring that they've got some lovely ice cream to enjoy when they do get better. Yeah, yeah, you know that sounds good. <laughs> right, I'm going to go up and do some coursework for my human rights law degree. <laughs> right here. Oh, I think I'll just stay down here. Uh, talking about which songs we like, and which hymns we want, and what music we enjoy in church, I often feel like the ice cream tester. If you've made the effort to join us here this evening, or if you're listening to this talk on YouTube, you might also feel like the ice cream tester. Church music is easy to belittle and easy to mock, and I must admit, I too find, uh, I enjoy the fine line between solemnity and absurdity. 
It's pretty hard to sing Psalm 147 without a twinkle in one's eye. The Lord hath no pleasure in the strength of an horse, neither delighteth he in any man's legs. And it's almost impossible to sing the grandest of anthems by Batashil to the text from Isaiah. Where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies towards me? Are they restrained? <laughs> but aside from the winking and the nudging idiosyncrasies of Anglicanism, we're here tonight because we care about the role of music in church, or at least we're curious about that role. And I want to suggest to you that you're not like the ice cream tester if you care about church music. In tonight's talk and next Wednesday, when we explore what lies behind the various attitudes to the pleasures of church music, we will very quickly see that some of the most vital questions are in play. What does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to be human? How have we evolved over the past 100,000 years? Do we have a soul? And what is the nature of that soul? What might God require of us? And do we care? And these are not frivolous questions like Raspberry Ripple. Neither are they ephemeral questions. They are old, old questions. And I'm not even going to try to answer them. Instead, I want to show you how other people's answers to those questions have fueled some kind of division within the world of church music. And I want to help you understand how some musical styles have become taboo within certain traditions and to trace the roots of a wide variety of attitudes towards musical pleasure in the Christian church. So then, people have been fighting over music in liturgy for an awfully long time. One of my favourite anecdotes is an 11th century account which describes the reception given to one Norman monk when he was appointed to a vacant English abbey again in the 11th century. And quote, the monks of Glastonbury detected the attitude of a conqueror in Thurston of Normandy, though there the point of contention was the style of chant. The monks wanting to keep their old chants as against those which Thurston wanted to foist upon them. In a fit of uncontrollable anger, Thurston set his knights onto the monks. Three of them were killed and many more injured in their own church where they tried to take refuge. Culture wars indeed. To call them culture wars today gives our topic something of a false grandiosity and a fake epic flavour. In contemporary terms, what is taking place across Christendom is much more banal, more subtle in its practical implementation and bureaucracy. There is tension in Christian church music between different aesthetics, different traditions, different theologies, different genres, different cultures, and their intermingling. And part of what inspired me to research the topic of musical pleasure was my own experience working at St. James Anglican Cathedral here in Toronto. Musical directors are required, rightly so, to offer a broad spectrum of music in their churches. And I think any church which sticks to the works of just one style, one composer, one period, I think that church would be doomed. And I took great pride in saying yes while working at St. James Cathedral, yes to balancing the bluegrass mass, yes to the jazz mass, yes to the 12th century, yes even to Freddie Mercury and the highfalutin Victoriana, the pomposity, yes to Taylor Swift and yes to Frank Sinatra. As long as we do it well, as long as the clergy give their blessing to the text being sung as not being blasphemous, then why not? And one day a request comes along for a major installation service, a wonderful gathering, over a thousand people present, and it's being filmed. And the song requested is a great one, one I really like, called Taking It to the Streets, by a 1970s rock band you may have heard of, called the Doobie Brothers. 
So let's take a listen. I just love that song. And my parents used to play the Doobie Brothers to me in the car on the way to school, and I have lots of good memories of them sharing wonderful music from the 1970s. And as a pluralistic musical omnivore, we did that song at uh, the cathedral, and among all the yeses within me, so filled with yes, there was a faint glimmer of a no. And even though I love the song, and even though the clergy approved of the text, something didn't feel quite right, and I wanted to find out what. And I started, I started to wrestle with the yes and the no within me, and was very pleased to read that we're in very good company with thinkers who have, been, who have grappled with this pleasure problem since the time of Christ, and even before. One of the most frustrating things about researching the history and philosophy of taking pleasure in church music is that each of us fundamentally experiences the world alone, which is to say, subjectively. Whatever I mean by I, me, the ego, the memory and consciousness of Robert, cannot leave my body and enter whatever I mean by you, the consciousness of you, experience some music there, and then return back to my body and compare notes. And it's hard to speak precisely, scientifically, or objectively about an experience of music. But first, I do want to say something about pleasurable musical experience which is true, which does not vary between a group of normal, healthy human beings. I want to talk about the body and the brain. And to do this, I must invoke the extraordinary research of Robert Satori, who is a professor of neuroscience at McGill within the Department of Psychology. Satori originally trained as an organist, which perhaps explains a lot, but maybe he was so frustrated by all the liturgy and culture wars that he thought, screw it, I'm going to find something unambiguous and objective to say about all this and become a neuroscientist. His research looks at the relationship between specific parts of the brain when listening to music. You may have heard of something called the reward system. This reward system takes place in a part of the brain known as the striatum. And all animals with brains have a reward system, from bugs to birds to bears. Evolutionary speaking, this part of the brain is very ancient. It goes back in other species over 500 million years. And this part of the brain lights up with activity when we engage with aspects of our survival, with things like food and sex and exercise. Things like drugs and gambling also engage our survival mechanisms through the reward system. Primarily through the release of hormones like dopamine and endorphins in the striatum. And Satori tells us that when we really enjoy a piece of music, it engages the reward system in a very similar way that we respond to food, and sex, exercise, gambling or drugs. So then, all of those people who believe that music in church is a lowly, 
vulgar and frivolous pursuit must be right, because it's no better than gambling or drugs. But not so fast. What separates us from animals in our enjoyment of music is that human beings also have an auditory system in something called the temporal cortex. This temporal cortex and the auditory system is, evolutionary speaking, a very recent development. Perhaps as little as 60,000 years old. Consider that, 500 million to 60,000 years old, two different parts of the brain. And this modern part of the brain deals with aspects of memory and emotional processing and cognitive expression. And what Zatori found was that it was the connection of circuitry between the very ancient animal part of the brain, the striatum, with the relatively modern part of the brain, the cortex, that can teach us something objective about our musical pleasures. Zatori and his team conducted experiments where they asked their subjects to value their experience of hundreds of different musical extracts, ones they didn't like, ones they liked, hundreds of different ones. And when people really loved a certain kind of music, they showed a gr greater connectivity between those two parts of the brain, the temporal cortex and the striatum. And when people generally disliked music, they did not show the same connectivity in the brain scans. Then they found that when the endorphin blocking drug naloxone was introduced, these circuits exhibited less activity. So what that means is the people who liked a certain music could be made to not like it and value it less through an intervention. And they also found, conversely, that by stimulating this circuitry with an electrode, the people who did not like certain music could be made to like it. We can make you like music. And they valued the music higher during the intervention with the electrode. So, imagine now a liturgy where a particularly unusual style of music is being offered throughout the service. It could be death metal, contemporary classical nail scratching, or dubstep, or grunge. Or how about a long-held note played by a bagpipe, just Aah! And now imagine that each of us, as we walk through the door, is handed a special personal electrode that stimulates this circuitry between the striatum and the temporal cortex during the liturgy. We just put it on the headset. Hey presto, we all enjoyed it. Problem solved. Not very satisfying. So thinking of our bodies like a very complex computer that just needs a little bit of tinkering with is ultimately, yes, very unsatisfying. Sure, knowing the location of the brain's processing of pleasure tells us the where, but it offers very little when it comes to the why and the how, and very little about the will, about personal growth. It tells us nothing of cultivation. The prospect of a universal solution, a uniformity of pleasure, a true aesthetic consensus, it fills me with a kind of dread and horror. And our quest for meaning of these various pleasures cannot be given to us by the neuroscientists at McGill University. It was Dr. Samuel Johnson who wrote that, quote, a voluntary descent from the dignity of science is perhaps the hardest lesson which humility can teach us. So let us descend together into the world of interpretation and ideas. Let's talk about instincts, gut instincts animal instincts, you might even say liturgical instincts. The first of the many paradoxes I want to explore is this. Our musical tastes are both reasonable and unreasonable, instinctual and manipulated. We simultaneously are unable to choose what we like, and at the same time we can change our tastes just by thinking about it. Allow me to demonstrate this. I want to play you a secular song, a non-religious song here by Peggy Lee. Okay, here we go. Have a listen. Are there years? Is that all there is? If that's all there is. I know what you must be saying. 
saying to yourselves, if that's the way she feels about it, why doesn't she just end it all? Oh no, not me. I'm not ready for that final disappointment. Because I know, just as well as I'm standing here talking to you, that when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? Imagine you're not in a church right now, if you can. How many people enjoyed that song? Yeah, most. Yeah, more than half. The vast majority of those of those of you who enjoyed it. Um, how many of you think you chose to enjoy it? Did anybody choose to enjoy that song? Their hands again. No, no one. No, no one here put their hand up. But, um, no one thinks they chose to enjoy it. And I'll speak for myself, but the first time I heard that song, I enjoyed it. And I don't believe I was choosing to enjoy it. I just, I just did. So now let's, let's complicate things. Let's make it a little bit muddier. What if I told you that that song we just listened to by Peggy Lee is officially Donald Trump's favorite song of all time. <laughs> Donald Trump wants that as his desert island disc. I'm not lying, it's true. That's his favorite song. Now imagine I played you the song again. For better or for worse, does that fact change your enjoyment of the song? Let's see another show of hands. For better or for worse, would, would that fact change your enjoyment of the song? <laughs> yeah, would, you, would, it, would it change your enjoyment of the song, knowing that? Yes, sir? No, a couple of hands, it's more ambiguous. So I put my hand there, I would say, knowing that it was Trump's favorite song, it would change my enjoyment of the song, it would color it a little differently, for better or for worse. And this might illustrate something important. Thinking, or cognition, or the mind, or the intellect, can to some extent change the body's instinctual pleasure in a piece of music, at least afterwards, maybe. Consider again the balance between the striatum and the temporal cortex, the ancient animal reward system interacting with exclusively modern human interpretation of memory and emotional processing. So this balancing act, this dichotomy, this tension between instinct and intellect is one of the most recurring themes in the culture wars and has swirled around liturgical music for over a thousand years. The heart, the gut, the body, the passions and the blood, and the soul and the intellect, the spirit, the inner life. Metaphors about the power of church music often invoke these words, these images, with differing emphasis. In the first centuries of the church, there was a great deal of suspicion about this supposedly dirty flesh. St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century tells us how to manufacture appropriate church music. Quote, when the, flush, when the flesh does not lust against the spirit, but yields to its commands, thus you produce spiritual melody. Basil the Great, also in the 4th century, tells us, I quote, the Holy Spirit mixed sweetness of melody with doctrine not to bring us down to the passions of the flesh by the pleasure of songs. Or Isidore of Pelusium in the 5th century complaining that church musicians were quote, misusing the sweetness of melody to arouse passion no better than the songs of the stage, making a divine gift into the wages of bodily destruction. The 16th century Elizabethan cleric 
Stephen Gosson makes the lineage even more clear when he says this, from piping to playing, from playing to fleshly pleasure, from fleshly pleasure to sloth, from sloth to sleep, from sleep to sin, from sin to death, from death to the devil. But my favorite manifesto for the supremacy of the soul over the body has to be that of the 19th century anarchist, the Frenchman Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who said this, separated from the highest thoughts of the soul, art is reduced to nothing more than the excitement of fantasy and the bodily senses. It is the source of sin, the poison spring from which flow all the fornications and abominations of the earth, a disease like a plague of lice gnawing away at our epoch, vice in all its refinement, the quintessence of evil. And this emphasis of the spirit over the body was very much adopted by the 16th century reformer John Calvin. And it might not surprise you to know that there isn't a massive corpus of Calvinist composers. But let's listen to some Calvinist music by French composer Claude Goudimel in his setting of Psalm number 8 from around 1560, which has this text. O Lord, our governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world, thou that hast set thy glory above the heavens. fleshly passions being aroused by that? No? Well, let's consider the opposite now. What about those who emphasize the heart, the blood, the gut over the intellect, the gut over the mind? We have Saint Nicetus of Ramesiana in the 5th century who makes the following admission, quote, human nature accepts virtually nothing unless it seems to offer pleasure. A psalm will only penetrate if it is sweet to the ear and gives pleasure. The 18th century writer Luc de Clapier asserted that les grands pensées viennent du cœur. So the, the greatest thoughts come from the heart. And the anthropologist Ellen de Sinayake writes that, quote, the arts enable ceremonies because they make ceremonies feel good. We use these bodily pleasurable elements to make ceremonies special. And Arthur Schopenhauer puts it even plainer than that. He says this, music speaks not of things, but of pure woe and joy and realities for the will. Music has nothing to say directly to the head, and it is a misuse of it to demand that it should do so. The 17th century rationalist philosopher Leibniz also tells us this, quote, the ultimate values are never anything other than visceral tastes, the primary primitive dispositions of the body. And D.H. Lawrence would agree. He says this, the essential function of art is a morality that changes the blood rather than the mind. The mind follows later in the wake my great religion is a belief in the blood, the flesh, as being wiser than the intellect. We can go wrong in our minds. And W.B. Yeats elaborates on this when he says that when we put only our contemplative nature into art, all grows unsubstantial and broken. And how can we hear this view playing out in church music? Well, one answer might be the adoption of popular secular dance and ballad tunes into the hymn book. Music designed specifically for bodily fun 
It's specifically, these are drinking songs, erotic songs, fleshly. They get co-opted by the church. So let's listen to them side by side. Near Bunbridge Town in the county down One morning last July Down a boring green came a sweet Colleen And she smiled as she passed me by She looked so sweet from her tube her feet To the sheen of her nut brown hair Such a once I fell by my shield Got myself for the sea I was here and there On that tree bay of the Gary's day From Galway to Dublin town No maid I'd seen like the fair Colleen That I met in the county down
Calvin would be turning in his grave if he heard that. And we're going to talk more about dancing and drinking and sex later. But for now, let's keep it simple and acknowledge that some churches have embraced music which was originally very fleshly indeed. And some churches have tried to completely reject that, focusing instead on the intellect. Now what many churches, including many Anglicans, have attempted to do is to bridge this gap between the body and soul, flesh and the intellect. And I want to suggest to you that much of the conflict that has arisen over the centuries about church music is a result of a failure to bridge this gap effectively or convincingly. And as I stand here in St. Bart's Church in Toronto, I want to commend to you a blog post on their website written by the Reverend Dr. Walter Hannon where he makes a good case for bridging this gap between the flesh and the intellect. He talks about religion transforming our whole selves, not just the mind and the soul, but specifically the body too. He even puts body in capital letters, which if you know Walter Hannum, would be like the rest of us screaming from the rooftop. Movement, hearing, sight, smell, touch, taste, are all legitimate avenues for Walter Hannum's mission. I think he's echoing the thinking of St. Athanasius in the 4th century, who asserted that, I quote, some of the simple ones among us still believe that sacred music is sung for the sake of pleasure. This is not so. Scripture has not sought what is sweet and persuasive, but rather sweetness was ordained to benefit the soul. Thus it is assured that we love God with our entire strength and capability. This itself, I think, being an echo from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 12, where Jesus instructs that we should love God with all our strength and all our heart, as well as all our might. So if music can help us do that, jobs are good and it would seem bridging the gap between the fleshly and the spiritual not as simple as it seems, and it's not just a question of emphasis. We're now talking about intentions, outcomes, transformation, and that most slippery of words, love. What moves us, what we love, changes over time. 
Music which today we think of as cerebral and intellectual can very easily have been thought of as having a physical, bodily wow factor 500 years ago. Today, if we want to access that bodily wow factor, we might need amplified guitars. We might need drums and some obscenity in order to achieve it. And I want to play you some extracts now, that not obscene ones, which I have chosen specifically because I believe they were all conceived to wow their congregations with a form of Christian spectacle. Try to listen to these now with two sets of ears on, if you can. Try to listen to it as the Calvinist, as the Puritan, who sees only the gratification of the flesh. And at the same time, see if you can listen with the ears of St. Athanasius, who just wants you to love God. <laughs>
appears to be that neither listening with the ears of the Calvinist or with the ears of St. Athanasius can bring an end to the liturgy and culture wars. I think the reason is because they both reject or try to dodge hierarchies. These are, nothing is okay and everything is okay theory of church music does not elevate our ability to bridge the flesh intellect gap. We have to confront the idea of hierarchies head on. And as we know from the ice cream tester sketch that we started with, hierarchies are obvious to us as cultural beings. We sense them in a similar way to that of sensing love. No one can ever fully prove or understand their love, but pretending that we can live well without love, or simply by loving everything, is obviously ridiculous. So let's put this in the context of pleasure. C.S. Lewis writes this in 1961. Quote, If you tell me something is a pleasure, I do not know whether it is more like revenge, or buttered toast, or success, or adoration, or relief from danger, or a good scratch. You have to say that art gives not just pleasure, but the particular pleasure proper to it. We must never commit the error of trying to munch whipped cream as if it were venison. And it's clear that there's a whole host of pleasures. There are guilty pleasures, facile pleasures, abstract pleasures like preferring blue or yellow. There are illegal pleasures, there are eccentric pleasures, sadistic pleasures, smug pleasures, conventional pleasures. I went on the keto diet and my parents said I was deriving masochistic pleasure from the attempt. I could go on. All of this is to say that there is obviously a hierarchy of pleasures. And we need to find our appropriate place within that constellation. David Foster Wallace puts it brilliantly during an interview in 1996 while talking about the game Tetris. You remember the game Tetris with the falling blocks? And he says this, quote, This stuff seems to me a little bit like candy. I mean, candy's all right, a couple of pieces a day. But when it becomes your diet, you get sick really fast. And part of the problem seems to be, first of all, that the candy is getting better and better and better. And second of all, that we as a culture have stopped or are afraid to teach ourselves that pleasure is dangerous and that some kinds of pleasure are better than others. The 19th century, 19th century philosopher William Hazlitt puts it another way. Quote, is there not an undeniable difference between the pleasure of one who indulges in a drunken debauch to celebrate some unexpected stroke of good fortune and one who does the same thing to drown care for the loss of a loved one? I'm also drawn to the line of Susan Sontag who wrote this, quote, an art becomes false and impotent when it seeks reconciliation at cut-rate prices with other ideas. Only a bad intellectual end is served when we blur all boundaries and call it sacred. And it's quite a radical thing to say these days that one thing is better than another thing. One piece of music is more effective than another. One anthem is more powerful than another, more appropriate than another. And George Orwell wrote this wonderful quote in the 1940s, and I quote, we can learn that the highest pleasure does not lie in relaxing, playing poker, drinking, eating, and making love simultaneously. Consider a wall. The first thing we demand of a wall is that it stand up. If it stands up, it's a good wall. And the question of its purpose is separable from that. And yet even the best wall in the world deserves to be pulled down if it surrounds a concentration camp. Or let's put it more simply, let's agree maybe that the best of drinks might be champagne or Napoleon brandy or Chateau Neuf de Pape maybe. But on a hot Saturday afternoon at a baseball game, they would be almost disgusting. We probably want a Coke or a beer. And I think the best way to illustrate this disconnect is through a joke. Um, is there a wider musical or liturgical equivalent to these comedy sketches of actors reading out rap, Lady Gaga and handsome lyrics 
and they read out a few praise songs too. Is there a liturgical equivalent to this? Eif, Eif, baby. Vanilla. Eif, Eif, baby. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen. Eif is back with a brand new invention. Something grab the hold of me tightly. Flow like a harpoon, daily and nightly. Will it ever stop? I don't know. If you turn off the lights, then I'll glow. I want to hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them. Let them hit me. Raise it, baby. Stay with me. I love it. <laughs> Luck and intuition play the cards with spades to start. And after he's been hooked, I'll play the one that's in his heart. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. Plant a seed, plant a flower, plant a rose. You can plant any one of those. Keep planting, find out which one grows. It's a secret, nobody knows. It's a secret, no one knows. Oh, no one knows. Mm bop, ba do ba da ba do bop. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. Yeah. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you, cause I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. <laughs> so what these jokers reveal so wonderfully is that it's possible to enjoy something for disconnected reasons or for wrong reasons. You can pass your enjoyment or repulsion through many different levels. The level of the combined content the song, the abstract sound of the music itself, and the isolated text out of context. The 17th century founder of the Spectator magazine, Joseph Addison, spells out this double bind quite well, I think. Quote, I consider the body as a proper engine for the soul to work with. As I am a compound of soul and body, I consider myself as obliged to a double scheme of duties. This is where sacred music finds itself, obliged to a double scheme of duties. And we know what the Gospel of Matthew says about trying to serve two masters. So next week, next Wednesday night, we're going to ask the question, who can assert a hierarchy of pleasures? Who has tried, historically, to maintain one art form over another in church? And how does this relate to legitimacy, connoisseurship, authority and good old-fashioned Marxist power and I want to pick up next week where Immanuel Kant left off at the end of his critique of judgment where he throws in the towel with this most wonderful resignation I quote is taste a natural and original faculty or is it only the idea of one that is artificial the judgment of taste the judgment of taste looks for confirmation not from concepts but from the concurrence of other people. The universal voice, the universal judgment is therefore perhaps only an idea, resting upon grounds, the investigation of which is here postponed, for as yet we are neither willing nor in a position to investigate. Thank you. I, I should say so, Next time I'm going to look at ideas of power and legitimacy and authority, uh, but I'm totally willing to take questions if you don't want to go there, because I'm going to save some remarks for that next time. But of, that, of what, what I'm talking about there, happy to take any questions as they might appear to you, if you wish. Don't be shy. No? Oh yes, go ahead, sir. Huh? 
Mm. We're talking about old-fashioned Methodist hymns which are based on popular tunes uh, going back to the 18th century. Yes, I think that's a really interesting feel. I, I think I'm trying to isolate in some of those extracts how, how the church has co-opted something that was very pleasurable and very fleshly and turned it into something that they're putting forward as being intellectual and to deny that it had any fleshly appeal or that it relates to some kind of transcendent, um, objective hierarchy. Um, that's one of the things I'm most interested in, is how we think about music as being fleshly or not. Uh, so the, the Gudimel extract, the, the bit of the Calvinist music, I thought was really interesting, because even that we had to take in through our ears. It still went through our body. So one of the things I perhaps should have concluded is that I think all music, has to, by definition, be fleshly. Even if you're trying your hardest for it to be intellectual, whatever that means. Uh, I think, yeah, it puts churches in an interesting double bind about what they think they're doing or where they think they are. Um, the analogy about the baseball field, I think, interests me. You know, where do we think we are on a Sunday morning? Or a Sunday evening, for that matter, or when we're in church? Um, I'm going to talk about this a bit next week, but is it distinguishable from anything else? Uh, I think it's, is it might be Jerome who says there's nothing to distinguish what's going on in his church with what's going on in a tavern. And why, is, why do we care about that? Why should it be different from what's going on in a tavern? It's an interesting, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I mean, I was talking with Walter Hannum in the pub about this. I think the, the Taliban is an interesting one. Uh, they really find music, music to be incredibly either powerful and mystical, so powerful that it has to be completely eradicated. And Walter's got a great line on this. Is that the, the wonderful thing about Christianity is that it acknowledges that God being in the form of perfect man and perfect God at the same moment is absolutely crucial to this idea of what we're doing here. Perfect human, perfect God. And that the music is somehow bound up in that question. That it it's, can be perfectly fleshly and perfectly intellectual, perfectly soul-bound, um, which I think for the Taliban is not possible. It has to be that's fleshly and this text is not, and our God is not. Perhaps in Christianity that sort of hardcore Puritan Calvinist, I think, is the one that would have the most suspicion towards the flesh. I mean, he was very, um, uh, very, what's the word, clear in his writings about what he thinks is going on with music. Yeah. Sorry, that, does that... Well, I, I'm just interested if anybody knew a Christian denomination that had... I mean, Absolutely not. Islam, there are... Oh, Cat Stevens. Yes, and yeah. when he became a Muslim, yeah. he gave up singing for decades until mm. some other period he, he was uh, honored as a Christian. Uh, but it, mm. the version of Islam that he was in, it was oddly music free. Mm. And I think, are there Christian denominations? Not that, that, not that I know of, but I'm perhaps the wrong person to ask. I think that the most extreme thing I can think of is a puritanical Calvinist. You, but I just read a book um, about Nantucket. And Nantucket. Example, I'm thinking of the Buddhas, 
in Afghanistan, the, the Taliban destroying them because they thought they're so powerful, that they, so, they could so easily corrupt us that they have to be gotten rid of. It's an interesting view. And I feel like it's, we are all on this spectrum between Calvin and Athanasius within us. We all have this capacity to see something as impure and fleshly and sacred. The question of how it's bound up with our intentions also, I think, is fraught. You know, just because you intend something to be holy, the question is, is that enough? And I'm going to explore that next week. <laughs> any, any other um, questions? Observations? Anger? Yes. Yeah. Um, I wonder, in the examples that you've played for us of popular music becoming um, the attributed to sacred music, um, those are all taken from a time when people were consuming music. They were producing music themselves. The popular culture was what people just did, yeah. rather than what they sold or what they were you know, forced to listen to as they wanted to shop them all. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you see a radical difference between you know the the off color uh, Scottish song <laughs> um, yeah. being turned being turned in, that everybody knew and sang uh, and that's perhaps Jerome might have heard in the tavern wondering how how it's different from what's mm. happening in church to you know the Doobie Brothers not being brought in wholesale but being brought in as an adaptation uh, into his, with his way to say your text with the intent of turning it into something new. Yeah, that's a fascinating argument. Um, what it really brings up to me is what is the purpose of church music? That is, uh, again, a very long subject of what we think it's trying to do. I think for me, I've tried to isolate how people think about pleasure very specifically, but if it comes to the purpose of church music, um, I love this writer, Ellen Disenayake, who uh, wrote an excellent book called Homo Aestheticus, where she traces in a kind of anthropological way, a sociological way, why we have music at all. She thinks of music as a doing thing, it's something that we do corporately, it's an act, not a commodity. What happens when you commoditize music? What happens when you consume music? I think it's a very interesting distinction to make. You know, which hymns that we all grow up doing, songs we all grow up singing around our table. Now we have a much more fragmented world, much more diverse world. It has wonderful benefits. It also has different questions that it brings up um, in how we build music in the church. You only have to look at a, one of the modern hymn books to see how it's desperately trying to just pull you know, the whole world together in 300 pages. Um, I think it kind of fails because it doesn't do any one thing very well, just a little bit of everything. But yeah, the, the idea of music as commodity is absolutely corrosive, yeah, I, I, I believe that. It, it pollutes it in the most interesting way, but then again I have a very spiritual relationship with music, or what I think is spiritual, um, and I can see that that could be totally misguided, that all music is in fact something that we are consuming or having powerfully foisted upon us by a conspiracy. Yeah. That's a very long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Any other questions before we send you on your merry way? Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I wish you'd stay at home. Thank you. <laughs>